Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Mike Hess, and I'm an alcoholic. It's good to be here tonight. It's good to be sober, and uh, to see some of you I've known from other meetings, it's uh, a pleasure, I hope. I hope everyone had a nice day today, whether you celebrate Easter, don't celebrate Easter, or did anything or not, that it just wasn't a torturous day. I, that's my wish for myself most days anymore. I um, I had forgotten I was speaking tonight, so I was, up until about 3.30, I was having a really pleasant day, and then um, I got the reminder message, and instantaneously started thinking, you know, I, I think I'm sick. Um, I'm not sure. I think I might be too sick to speak. Now, I, I hadn't felt bad up until about, well, then. And um, uh, and then I did the right thing that I was supposed to do. I appreciate you, Lee, for letting me, for reminding me. Honestly, I did forget it was tonight. <laughs> I thought it was next week for some reason. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I've been taught in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I try to try to practice this maybe more than anything else, even when I'm not doing well, even when I'm not happy, well, that doesn't make much difference. I was, I, I was told that one of the most spiritual things any of us can do is to do what we say we're going to do, to be where we say we're going to be, to show up when we say we're going to show up, and to just do it. And, um, and I try to, try to do that. I, you know, I remember hearing Clancy many years ago say it's just much easier to do what you, what you said you were going to do than to try to come up with reasons later and explain it away and deal with any kind of guilt you might have. So <clears throat> I'm glad I got to be here tonight. Uh, I got a, a voice message from uh, Terry Marie and Paul uh, claiming they're in Florida and can't make the meeting. I, I don't have any proof. Uh, I'll, I'm going to ask for airline ticket stubs at some point just to see when they actually came back and I was I guess sad to hear that it must not have a zoom in Florida but anyway I uh, enough about that I've been sober since May the 30th 1980 uh, I've been a member of Alcoholics Anonymous since since I actually started coming around with the exception of a couple weeks at the very beginning that I'll get to in a minute and Sailor I don't know if you stayed on here or, or not I don't see you um but congratulations, and, uh, uh, oh, there you are. Uh, yeah. Those kind of things, like taking a chip, used to terrify me so much when I was new that I would hope the meeting had forgotten to do it the night that I was due. I have been concerned all of my life, without even recognizing it most of the time, about what other people think of me. I have been worried about not looking good, I've worried. Uh, uh, I've had, I guess, grave concerns that I'm not cool, or I, I got to make sure I look cool. I've decided one of the questions that they ought to ask prospective members of AA is, did, "Have you ever felt it necessary to be cool?" And if the answer is yes, then just come on in, it, uh, because it seems to be a, a fairly uh, common thing for some of us. But I, rem- but I wanted to take the chip. I always suffer from conflicting emotions. You know what I'm saying? On the one hand, I wanted to get the recognition of taking the chip, but not actually take the chip, which is very hard to do. It's kind of like trying to lose weight while eating haagen which I also uh, try to do on an almost nightly basis. So uh, let me back up a little bit. I was born in, a, um, in an alcoholic home in upstate New York in a little area where people live together by their uh, former na- uh, nationalities. I'm of Italian descent. I lived in the Italian section, and uh, my father owned a little bar there. And the effects of being in the bar business um, on our family were good and bad, of course. It was a way to make a pretty good living for a while. But my dad was alcoholic, and uh, but he was one of those... As a child, to me, he was one of those nice alcoholics. I had developed some ideas that were going to curse me all my life, and one of them when I was really young was this. My mother grew up in an alcoholic home, never drank, died never having had a drink of alcohol that she was at least aware of, and uh, ended up marrying an alcoholic man and having two sons that are alcoholic. 
But it was really easy as a child to see who in my family was happy, and it was not my mother. She was the strength. She was loving. She was kind. She held things together. She took care of the messes my father would bring home or cause for the family. But I could just look at their faces and see who was happy. And I would go into my dad's little little joint. It was a joint more than a, I don't know how to explain it. It's one of those corner bars like they have back east that people hang out in. I, it seemed like it was never closed. Uh, but m- once in a while, we'd end up in there, my brother and I, in the morning. And, and the characters fascinated me. The smell of the place fascinated me. My Uncle Dominic worked behind the bar. He was always washing the glasses. I liked the way it sounded and looked, the stainless steel, the... Uh, just everything about it. The guys were sitting around making bets for the horse races that day. People were laughing and having a good time, at least in the morning. And I came to this idea very young, that the only thing wrong with bad drinking is other people's reaction to it. That if people just wouldn't complain, people like me who are fun people could have a good life. That that, that my poor father and some of the other uh, folks that Young yeah, around with married, married badly. They married people who didn't understand that some of us are just, uh, you know, meant to have fun. And uh, after a while, my dad got called back into the military. He was in the reserves. They activated him and they had him run the nightclubs, which he ended up doing then for 20 years. He ran the NCL clubs, the officers clubs, and those were some really nice clubs. I mean, we were at good places. Uh, he was in Panama City, Florida two different times for six years. The club was right on the beach. And again, it, in me, it, it reinforced my belief that bars and, and clubs where they have dances and bingo and people hanging out were the place to be. My mother was a beautiful lady and a great dancer and a good singer. Um, most of you are too young to remember I Love Lucy, but they reminded me of Lucy and Desi. My dad was dark, you know, and dark hair. My mom was a beautiful uh, strawberry blonde kind of hair and um, they would go out and everything about it fascinated me. I liked the way I liked the whole deal and on the other hand I grew up with a lot of fear about my dad's drinking in this respect there was always the threat they were going to break up and I would lay awake as a child and hope to God that they wouldn't they, they never did. I'll jump to the end of that story they never did break up but it would it was a troubling deal. When I was about we moved a lot I, by the time I got into the 10th grade, I'd been to nine different schools. And the last time we had moved, right before uh, I was turning 13, uh, we moved out here to Riverside, California. There's a base out here. My dad ran the clubs out the, over there for a few years. And my, my life was pretty good in spite of the alcoholism and the devastation that, that can do in a family that I'll save for some other day, if it's ever worth talking about anymore. Um... My folks put me into an all-boys Catholic high school. Uh, I did well. I enjoyed being there. You know, I would always come in anywhere shy and nervous, and and I'm the kind of person who's so worried about making a mistake publicly. I mean, these are everything I'll tell you will be true tonight, but if I was at a bingo game and got bingo, I wouldn't yell out bingo. You know what I mean? Just in case I made a mistake. I'd hand you the card uh, in case there was no 062 or whatever. Uh, In school, if there was a a talk to be given, I was just petrified until I got settled in somewhere and then I was comfortable. And this little Catholic school was a pretty safe place. There were only 75 of us in my graduating class, and I enjoyed it. My senior year was the best year I was going to have for many years. I liked it. I was was young. I was healthy. I surfed a lot in those days. I had a beautiful uh, Ford Woody station wagon and a nice new surfboard. I was down at the beach a lot. I hadn't gotten into any relationship yet, so I was still pretty happy. I mean, life was going on really well. And um, I went down to spring break, went to dances, met girls. I don't think I had one conscious problem except, you know, minor little things. But, I mean, no real problems going on at all. And I came back from that little trip, and I drank for the first time for real. I don't mean sipping, but I mean drinking. I am a bad drinker. I'm the kind of person that Bill Wilson talked about in the big book about Alcoholics Anonymous who was seldom mildly intoxicated, always more or less insanely drunk. I drank badly from the very beginning, and I drank in blackouts that very first week that I drank. I didn't even hear the term for 14 more years. Never heard it uh, at all in my life until I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. 
Within a few weeks of starting to drink, my problems started to mount and they started to come about quickly. I went to an all boys Catholic high school that was a college prep school. And it was during the Vietnam War. Those of you who may have been around then uh, may remember that in order to not be drafted into the Army, if you took 15 units each semester in college, you didn't have to go. And I knew that. I signed up the first semester for 15 units, the second semester for 16 units. But drinking and running around was much more important than just about anything else for me. And so at the end of that first year, I'd actually completed six units. I, um, I completed one unit in introduction to college. It was a one-hour course. I'd finished that. Uh, I had two units in PE, and I'd finished one sociology course. I was shocked 18 months later when I was in boot camp. That's how my mind had gone down, down the tubes. That same summer that I started to drink, I heard about what I consider, I'm going to tell this as quick as I can, uh, what I consider to be the best value in narcotic sales in California. They were called Bennies. They were the big, fat, white, double-scored tablets. You paid $1 and you got 10 of them, and they really did wire you. And that all, I heard about them my first couple of weeks of drinking. Some of the guys were saying, hey, you can get these pills that'll keep you up and give you some energy. And I'm going to tell you the story with having to use, I, I told you I'm very hip and cool, so I, I'm going to have to use some very hip words, up, which I will emphasize for those of you who aren't. I, uh, I called my Connect, and I ordered $1 worth of Bennies. And, it, and I had become convinced somehow that law enforcement found out about this big deal going down. I don't know how I thought they knew, but I thought they knew. And so when I went over to pick up that night, I'm driving this little Volkswagen that has no muffler. I have Coors labels that I've been drinking from the beer stuck all over the car. So if the police stop me, they don't have to say how many drinks it had. They can just count the decals on my car. Um, I have these terrible blue windows I did myself with all the paint. It was a horrible job. In other words, I was drawing, the car would draw attention no matter who was in it. And I had decided I'd been followed. And so I did everything I could to lose the tail. I would drive into people's driveways, park for a while, pull back out, spin around, turn my lights on and off. It took me forever to go two miles. And I got over to where this guy, Bill, was working, and he came running out, and he said, I couldn't get you the, um, the Bennies. Do you have five dollars, which is all I had, but I gave it to him, and he gave me this little packet, called, and he said, "This is called methadrine, which is just the grandfather of methamphetamine." I now know, and he ran off because he thought the FBI was after him, and I, I, I sped away before capture, which, which is a lie. You, you can't speed away in a Volkswagen, but I floored it and I putted out of there like you would out of the Autopia at Disneyland. <laughs> and again, I did everything I could to lose, and it worked. I lost to all law enforcement. Nobody got me that night. When I opened that packet, it was this little bit of yellowish white powder. He hadn't given me any instructions. And I thought I'd been cheated. It was such a small amount. Somebody was talking about how much mushrooms cost, Cameron was. I, um, I put a little bit on my tongue and I waited upwards for a couple minutes. Nothing happened. And so I put it all in my mouth. My mom used to wait up for me no matter what when I was drinking, and that evening I got home early. You know what I mean? I came shooting through that door, and my dad happened to be home too. And I'll tell you what I experienced that night. I'm creeping around my own house, my own bedroom, feeling wicked, like I'm a big-time gangster. I love the country. I chewed the inside of my mouth raw. I neatened anything. Even if it was already neat, I re-neatened it. I looked out the window all night because it seemed like time stood still. And then I read a newspaper. I'd never read one. Not really. I read, I read everything. I read the legal notices in the newspaper. I didn't know there was such a thing. And when my parents got up, I resumed our talk. Blah, 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 blah. I hadn't been talking much that year, but it ended that night. I started to talk so much that they never asked me another question for weeks, I don't think. <clears throat> I bring it up for this reason. When I came into Alcoholics Anonymous... I'm so grateful that AA doesn't really require that we know anything about alcoholism or even ourselves in order to be a member. Because by the time I got here, I had developed such an odd attitude about drinking. I was not offended when people said I was a bad drinker. If I met a pretty girl, like one of you at a bar, you said to me, you know, you drink too much. I honestly inside would think, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, 
so do you. Because people that drank and ran around and did those kind of things were the people that I thought had fun lives. They were the ones out there doing stuff. Not the guy who goes home and just sits there. I mean, who wants to be like them? You know, I... Uh, but when I also came in here and people said things to me like, hey, can you just not drink today? I started thinking, maybe I'm not alcoholic. Maybe if I hadn't been so wired all those nights that I was out there, because I used a lot of stuff uh, that would help keep me, give me extra energy. Uh, maybe if I hadn't been so wired, I wouldn't have drank so much. And maybe if I hadn't such ha had such bad hangovers and such violent reaction to alcohol, uh, maybe I wouldn't have used anything. And I'm having one of those thoughts one night when a guy named Clint Hodges, some of you may remember, was speaking at my home group. Clint was a lovely, great speaker. About He really was. And he said, uh, you know, our first step doesn't say that we're alcoholic. It says we're powerless over alcohol. Ask yourself how well you drank the times you did drink. If you were somewhere in my drinking days, and I was there, you never had to ask, has he been drinking? You know what I'm saying? Uh, I not only slur my words, I look slurred. I act slurred. I have, I have moods that switch in a heartbeat from extremely happy to crying to fighting to biting to, I mean, anything. It's, and, and over and over and over again. So um, it put that to rest for me. I have never, since I stopped all my stuff on May the 30th, 1980, ever, ever craved being wired. But I have had to do the battle with journey. I'm a little bit ahead. But I just wanted to put that out there because sometimes at these meetings nowadays there are a lot of people that abuse speed, and I, I like to get it done. So anyway, I went on and on. When I got when I was about 19 years old, I got a well, 20, I guess by the time she got pregnant, um, chasing women, a woman, one girl, drinking, listening to rock and roll, and running around and sitting around motels with dark glasses on and being cool became the, the biggest thing I did all the time. I liked being out there at night and running and doing the kind of things I did. And this nice young lady that I was dating got pregnant. And to cut this a little shorter, uh, she was going to go off and, and uh, have our baby um, and give, give her up for adoption. And I'd, I'd already moved on. I had a new girlfriend, was running, going to parties. And, and one day it just hit me that I just couldn't do it. And I called her up and, and Linda and I got married and... Uh, and I've had things like that happen in my life that slowed down the immediate devastation that's about to come. I didn't drink any better because of it, but I behaved better more often. Uh, I went to work as a janitor at nights and weekends, went back to school, cleaned up my WFs and Fs, got a degree, got a nice job. But something happens to a man like me, even in sobriety. And I think this is one of the biggest things I've ever learned about myself. I suffer from a delusion that I know what it is that's going to make me happy. And that's both before Alcoholics Anonymous and after. And every time I have the idea that I think I know what it is that I need to have just to be okay, of course, it never works. I've got a buddy in A, he's been sober a lot of years, too, and he said to me one day, not too long ago, he said, you know what? <clears throat> if I just had darker hair again and was a little bit thinner, I think I'd be fine. And he was serious. And I pointed out to him, I knew you when you had dark hair and you weren't fine then either. But that's the kind of thinking I have. It, uh, I come up with these ideas that, that, that I've just got, there's something so unsettling, so unhappy in me. So I lack an ability to just be okay with the way things are. I've spent most of my life on the verge of happiness. I'm almost there. I just got to get one more thing into place. Or I just got to get rid of one more thing. To, as soon as these all get together, then I'm really going to let them not breathe. I'm just going to sit around and be, I'll sit on a porch, maybe in a rocking chair. I don't know. I'll do something like people that have peace of mind might do. But it's never worked for me because I have mistaken the reality of what my problem truly is. In late 1979, I was married to my second wife. And if, if a woman was going to fix me, it should have been her. I mean, she was a blonde, beat girl, uh, smart, good, good skier, um, independent, had a nice job. We 
met, got married fairly quickly. Yeah. Uh, um, and I was selling real estate, making more money than I was going to ever make sober for a lot of years. My Mercedes, we're living in a big white two-story Cape Cod house. Life's going on from the outside like it ought to be really good. But I'm drinking almost every day. But week, Monday, Friday, I drink every day at the first they close down. I'm becoming more and more, more and more angry. Anger was, is a big thing with someone like me. It comes up, it can come up in sobriety in a heartbeat if I'm not careful. I'm watching. And, I'm, and I've got an idea. I'm going to get a divorce. I'm going to get out of real estate. And I'm going to move to Newport Beach. And finally, I can just finally start over again. Went to Las Vegas and had one of those weekends come true that I always had wanted to have come true, which um, I won't get into a great deal t- detail tonight. But I got in some trouble finally that weekend and uh, ended up with a terrible hangover. What I didn't pay any attention to much at that, in those months was this. My wife, then wife, she's my former wife now, and my mother had started going to Al-Anon. But my wife didn't learn the love part. Learned at least very well. And uh, if there's one thing I can't stand, it's to be ignored. And I started to get real uncomfortable, and I, and I knew I was in trouble, so I went to my first day. And I walked in there, and it was as uncomfortable for me as it is. I'm walking into places where I don't know people. I don't, I don't make good small talk and hang out talk with strangers. And I already told you I hate speaking in public. And so there's, I didn't know it was a participation meeting. The leader had a gavel, and he'd rap on a table and point to people to speak. And I'm sick to my stomach, too afraid to get up and leave, but sick to my stomach that he's going to actually ask me to say something. So I pretended to be asleep during most of the coffee. I would do anything not to make eye contact with the guy. But I do suffer from conflicting simultaneous emotions. And as soon as he didn't call on me, my feelings were hurt. You know what I'm saying? I hated it. I just hated the guy. I hated AA. Uh, it was a miserable experience. Uh, I heard a man one time, a year or two after that, talk about going to his first meeting and feeling just as bad. And he said when he went home and his wife asked him what he thought, he said the opposite of what I did. I told my wife it was a terrible place, that I was never going back. And she agreed if I didn't drink for 30 days, I didn't have to. But this guy told his wife it was a great place. He told her it would help him, her, the dog, everybody. He said there was only one problem. He said that Alcoholics Anonymous was such a popular organization in Riverside, it was full. There was no more room. And he told her that he was on a waiting list. I thought he was a genius. He said that they told him that as long as he was on the waiting list, he could drink. I sat there. I was. I marveled at the man, uh, his ingenuity. I bring. I say that sometimes, and if you need a story to tell somebody, I, that's why I'm here to pass that one along. Because here's what I really believe now, after 40 years. When it was my time to get sober, it was my time to get sober. Whether I felt comfortable around people, whether I understood anything about real alcoholism, whether I, whether I wanted to be here, whether I had a desire to stop drinking, all those questions that people seem to be asking me now in, 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 in hindsight really didn't matter much. Because on May the 30th, 1980, I spent the night away the night before again. I woke up at a friend's couch. It was 6 o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> I was hungover again. I'm allergic to cats. His white cat had slept on my head, so I had white animal hair all over my face. I'm, my eyes were swollen. I'm sick as a dog. I went down to the uh, Del Taco and got a chocolate milkshake for breakfast. Took a little Black Beauty for energy and got some cores. And I had a feeling come over me that can come over me in sobriety. It's sadness. It's an aloneness. It's an inability to figure out what to do anymore for a little bit. I am just was so worn out. I had enough of a buzz going, though, that I went back to where that little meeting was, and they had a three-week program, and I checked myself in and was not a willing participant. But here's what happened to me on my last Sunday night in there. I'm going to be discharged on a Tuesday, and they announced again every Sunday, there's a, the hospital institution panels here. And I thought, oh, God. Because they, they made us quit watching TV, which I didn't want to quit. And then I went in there, and it was one little white-haired man that looks like me. 
By the way, I, I've noticed I'm starting to look like Joe Biden and uh, Mike Pence on Zoom. I, uh, I'm going to dye my hair tomorrow. The, um, this little guy's up there, and I'm pointing out to the other patients in this place, you know, that's not a panel. You have to have two or more people to have a panel. And people are saying things to me like, shut up. And I'm pouting and whining around about stuff and daydreaming about my move and my divorce, my pending divorce and all the rest of it. And the panel's talking like I'm doing, and I'm daydreaming like some of you were doing, when he said something that broke me out of my own mind for just a moment. He said, do you want to know what I found in Alcoholics Anonymous? And I thought, no. I, I, what do, why do I care what you What would you find? You found God? No, that's great. That's nice. You made friends. I still got him waiting for me at the bar. And he said it a second time, and by now I'm so pissed at him, I'm actually paying attention to him. He said, do you wonder what I found here? And I'm thinking, no, I don't know. I don't want it. Nobody wants to know. And then he said, well, I'm going to tell you. And so I'm having this fight in my head, and I'm thinking to myself, why did you ask us twice if you were going to make us listen anyway to your answer? But I'm glad he did because it got my attention. He said, what I found here is a higher degree of mental comfortableness. He said, I have peace of mind. I'd never had peace of mind. He said he was going to go home to a wife that he loved. Sleep on clean sheets, get up in the morning and fix his lunch in his lunch pail. Have breakfast with his children because he wanted to. Go to work and give him eight hours of work for eight hours of pay. Come home and have dinner with his family and then go to a meeting and smoke cigarettes and drink coffee and that he'd never had it so good. What I think he was describing is serenity. The real gift of working the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and surrendering. The real gift of no longer having to have the answers to run my own life. The real gift of not trying to figure out what has to be in place just for me to have some type of peace of mind. I had spent most of my life leaving. I never left, but I was always leaving. Do you know what I'm saying? Mentally leaving. I was not present. I, I, no matter where I was, the job was just not quite okay. I did well. When, no matter who I lived with or was married to, it was like, you know, I just, I just got the wrong one again. It's got nothing to do with that. I used to say that I suffered from delayed clarity that I always get great insight right after a major decision, like I do. I get great insight as soon as I said that, or buying a car. I buy cars, bring them home, don't like them. And I think, well, how did I get this? I have tortured myself most of my life, and can it, it can happen in sobriety if I'm not paying attention, or even if I am paying attention, with the tortures of my own mind about what I perceive to be mistakes. And they're not always mistakes. One of the greatest lessons I've learned in Alcoholics is, Anonymous is this, that just because I believe something to have been the wrong thing that just happened is often not true and, in fact, just the opposite. When the hand of God starts working in my life sometimes, it's come at the expense of something else, and I'm convinced there's no way out of this. You know, there's a paragraph in the big book that talks about, says, and then we had, first of all, we had to quit playing God. I never thought I was playing God when I was trying to do things in life. I thought I was just trying to do life. The God I was raised with didn't get involved in daily things or guidance or anything. He was just God. He went to confession. He went to mass. He did those things. God was there. And if you lived an okay life, maybe he went to heaven. But it never dawned on me that there might be something uh, in, that existed that would help guide me. I got a sponsor that week. I, went to, I read a big book for the first time in my life after I heard that little old man talk that night. And to this day, Bill Wilson's writings still have that kind of peace for somebody like me. It brings my emotions back into line, maybe not perfectly, but it soothes them more than anything else I've ever done. I asked a man to sponsor me a couple weeks later because he looked rich. I thought he could help me in the world. Um, it turned out he was going broke, He was, a, but he was a member of the Pacific Group who had just moved out here. And had I known anything about the Pacific Group or any of the rest of that, I would have never asked Don to be my sponsor. Because he immediately made me start taking actions better than the way I think and feel. He told me I wasn't moving anywhere, that I wasn't going to make any major changes my first year sober. I was going to continue to go to work. I was going to stay married to my wife. Uh, and I was going to continue to live in my house and show up at these meetings with him and do these kind of things in AA. 
I wasn't sure I was going to do any of those things. But I hung around with him just long enough. He took me to hear the great speakers of the time everywhere. And one of the ones we went to listen to quite often was Chuck Chamberlain. I even got to spend one afternoon at his house with him for a few hours just with Chuck um, and listen to him talk. And people, he, more than anyone, but people like him seem to talk about a higher power that actually helped out in life, that actually did things. He used to say all the time, I've come out here to tell you monkeys two things. But they can surrender. Surrender. Trying to make the world be what you think it needs to be, that there's peace in that. You know, when you've got too much fear, there's no peace in it. Because to really let go of something is terrifying for people like me. I'm the kind of person when I perceive a problem, there's an urgency factor to it, even if it's the most minor problem on earth. Are we having trouble with the internet? Or can you tell? Are you guys still there? Did I lose you? No, we're, we're still here, Mike. Okay, my sign, um, my computer saying talk unstable. Here, but you can, you can you not have me using it out a bit. Yeah. You can do. For instance, at home, I. At home. No response. And I would say, you want me to lie? And he'd say, it's not a lie for you, for God's sake. Just go do it. You don't know how you think. And I'd go in and do it. And I would tattle on her again. Put up Michael. <clears throat> lay him on the pillow. That to you is none of your business. One night she complained about him, and I thought it was my way out of having to stay with her. So I went to my wife. Did you know? You know, you're done. And he said, you know, that that's all right. He said, in the morning, fix her a cup. And we do it every single morning. And, you know, my manhood was gone. We felt, I'm, I'm up fixing coffee for a woman that I've been planning to help. And, but I got up and I did it. And there was coffee on her side of the bed every morning. And then one day I got up and she'd done it for me. What I learned from that is this. If you want somebody to bring you coffee in the morning, all you have to do is get up every day for two years and do it first. Huh? She uh, she picked up on the same thing. It kept our family together. My children from my first marriage came to stay with us for temporarily and ended up living there until they finished high school. Things improved substantially. But see, for somebody like me, it's never quite enough, huh? I was applying. At the end of the year, I started applying for all kinds of jobs that I thought I deserved and didn't get any of them. And I kept saying, where's this higher power that everybody talks about? It's just another another fiction just to tell people. And one day I got a call from Orange County, and I've get, gotten a job offer as a probation officer. And I told them about my drinking, about my drug use. I told them about my little minor arrests. I told them the truth. Because you told me to, and the lady that called said she was the medical director. And she wanted to know <clears throat> um, what I did about my problem. And I told her I was in AA. And she said, well, what step are you working? And I knew a step. And she asked me if I had a sponsor, and I did. And she said, well, can we like people like you? And I was grateful uh, until my first day at work. You know what I'm saying? When I got there, I immediately thought, I, I don't want to be here because that is a panic reaction that I have frequently. As soon as I say I'm going to do something, once I'm there, I don't want to do it anymore. And my sponsor once again said, you know, you're going to stay put. You're going to give them one year and they don't care. They were doing just fine before you came to work. If they tell you to stand on your head, stand on it. And I did that. And here's the result of all of that. <clears throat> The kids that I was supposed to supervise were supposed to go to a continuation school, and I would go by and check on them on a daily basis. And there was a law school about a half a block away. And I eventually signed up and started going to law school at nights and on weekends. And on my sixth day birthday, uh, I got the results from the state bar in the mail that I had become an attorney in California. And through a series of things that seemed like mistakes, I ended up being hired as a prosecutor, a trial lawyer. 
I had an unbelievably good career. I became chief of homicide and ran the homicide division for a long time. I've done major trials. I've had the perfect job for me. But I would have missed it based on my own emotion. I am a strong believer in sponsorship. I've had four sponsors, and all four of them are strong men. And one of the biggest benefits of having a sponsor, in addition to learning how to behave in AA and what to do, for me has been this. I tell them the truth, and they can listen to what I perceive as a problem or a real problem and not respond to it with the same emotional uh, twists that I might put on it. And one of the things that I've learned here is this. Just because I feel bad doesn't mean I'm doing it wrong. I used to believe that if I was in a bad mood or sad or scared or depressed or any of the negative things that are part of my nature in some days, that somehow I must have, I must do, have to do something else to fix that feeling. But, you know, I know for me, not all our kids are the same. I have strong emotional um, responses to the world. And as a consequence of that, I have made some horrendous decision. I think alcoholism is one of the saddest diseases on the face of the earth, not only for the people that we affect, but maybe more so for the, or at least as much for the alcoholic. Because the people I know well are, do this. All we've ever tried to do was just have some peace of mind. All we've ever had, tried to do is just be okay. And trying to find out the form to be okay has resulted in some real nasty things for me. But alcohol always worked. No matter how worried I was, if I walked into a bar and started to have a beer with you, in a little while, I was doing what we say in AA. I was in the moment. I didn't care anymore about the past, and I wasn't too worried about the future. But there was too much violence and too much trouble and too much ugliness in my drinking. I couldn't keep going that way. When I was 90 days sober, the urge to drink hit me full force. I was out of town, but nobody in my family would have known that I was drinking unless they uh, told them. Uh, they wouldn't have cared, probably. They, thought, they would have thought 90 days was a good deal. And instead of doing that, I did something that I must have heard somebody say at a meeting, although I don't recall it. I got on my knees and I asked God to remove the obsession to drink. And when I got up from that, it was only down there for less than a minute, that that obsession was gone and has never come back for me, ever. I work hard in Alcoholics Anonymous. And by that, I mean I do the kind of things I was taught to do. I have commitments at meetings and I show up. I was the trash boy and mop boy for almost eight years at my home group. I enjoyed it. I got mad when people would take the back from me. Um, I became a part of it. For somebody like me, that is so scary. Because I live in my own judgmental world. I live in my mind, and in my mind, I judge myself harshly, and I assume that everybody else does too. And I need to look, I needed to learn and need to continue to remember that that's not always the truth. Let me finish with this. In my business in homicide, I went out to homicide scenes a lot of times. I've seen a lot of uh, death. I've seen a lot of horrible tragedy. And it's helped me to refine my belief in a higher power in a good way. I've heard well-meaning people trying to soothe their family and friends say things like this. We don't understand God. Sometimes God's trying to teach us a lesson when those things happen. And that is as far from the truth for me as there is. I don't think God does anything bad to us. Otherwise, I should have been punished beyond belief by now. I think it's a kind, tender, loving, higher power that exists. Because even when I've intentionally done things that are wrong, when I've asked for help, I may have to pick up the tab, but when I ask for help, my life has been taken care of by something well beyond me. I've had a tremendous life in sobriety, but that doesn't mean my emotions knew it. My emotions aren't always attached to what reality is. So I have to do this on a daily basis. I stay in AA for a lot of reasons, but one of the main ones is this. There's one thing I can't give myself, even with all the evidence to the contrary. I cannot give myself hope, because once I sense something's wrong, it feels like it's going to be horribly wrong and not ever be okay. But you can give it to me. I stay attached to you for a lot of selfish reasons, and one of them is the simple fact that 
you're able to reassure me that if it never gets any better than it is right now, is it okay? Because it's never current pain I can't handle. It's always the future pain that's overwhelming for someone like me. I've never had it so good. It's time for me to stop. Um, I guess I needed a meeting tonight this Easter, and I, I hope all of you stay safe and, uh, and well. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.